Folks, good morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, fourth Annual Texas Tribune Festival. This is the uh, the first track in the, uh, excuse me, the first panel in the immigration track. And um, maybe a while back, you know, immigration and uh, border security might have been two different topics, but it seems like you can't talk about one without talking about the other as well. So these will overlap in both of those. But the focus today is going to be uh, obviously on border security. Uh, a couple housekeeping items before we get going. Um, if you don't mind uh, turning your phones on silence, um, if you guys feel free to, to tweet. We ask that you use the uh, Tribune Fest hashtag, and there's also specific hashtags for uh, every track. So this one is TTF Immigration. We're going to do a quick 40-minute uh, uh, discussion that I'll moderate, and I'll have the, the gentleman engage in what I'm sure will be a lively discussion. And then the last 20 minutes, we'll do a, a Q&A. We'll uh, we have a microphone set up. We all just kind of line up, and we'll go in order. Uh, we do ask that you uh, ask a question. Um, and you know, try to avoid making a, a speech or a statement just uh, in the interest of time so we're fair and we get everybody that wants to ask a question uh, able to get that out. Um, we are uh, having lunch um, after, the, uh, after the next track. It'll be out at the South Mall. I hope it doesn't rain on this. I'm not sure what the contingency plan is if it does. Maybe go to Players before they close it down or something. <laughs> um, and then this evening there is a, a reception at the courtyard. Uh, everybody's welcome to have a cocktail and hang out. And everybody takes a deep breath after all the facilities are over and they have to relax a little bit. So you guys can meet the panelists and ask questions. And you're more than welcome to do that. So I'm going to get started with some brief introductions um, for our panelists that were gracious enough to take the time today to, uh, to be here. Um, I'll start uh, to my left with uh, Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst, who uh, has served as Lieutenant Governor since 2003. Uh, he began his uh, public service career with the U.S. Air Force, uh, where he served as an intelligence officer. Uh, he speaks better Spanish than I do, um, which is, you know, pretty, pretty impressive there. Um, and before he served as Lieutenant Governor, he was elected Texas Land Commissioner. Um, and last week, the Lieutenant Governor, you wrote a, uh, a letter to the Mexican government that was highly critical of what you deemed their, uh, their criticism of the deployment of the National Guard, uh, especially on the anniversary of 9-11, and uh, I think you you said uh, Mexico's response was a call on Texas to open our international border to illegal immigration. So this is definitely something that's been in the news and we'll get to. Uh, to his left is Congressman Henry Cuellar, who's represented the 28th Congressional District since 2005. <coughs> Excuse me. He's the only uh, Texas Democrat to serve on the powerful House Appropriations Committee. Uh, he also serves on subcommittees for Homeland Security um, and state foreign operations and related programs. Um, and uh, Congressman Cuellar actually recently ruffled some feathers as well. He was the only Democrat to vote with uh, the Republicans on a controversial measure that would have Actually, they voted with me. No, that's what they voted You couldn't even wait to tell us for the introduction. <laughs> um, and this would have rolled back a, uh, a provision to a 2008 trafficking law um, that would have, uh, what Congressman Cuellar says, it's important to have uh, faster hearings for a lot of these Central American miners that have come, uh, coming over the border, which is also, I'm sure you guys know in the news lately. Uh, so, of course, we'll get to that. To his left is Agriculture Commissioner Todd Staples, who was first elected to that post in 2007. He, uh, in the Congress, and a good friend. He served in the House together. And uh, before that, he was uh, in the Texas House and the Senate, as well on the, the Palestine City Council. Uh, and he was uh, Congratulations Commissioner. He was uh, recently named the next president of the uh, Texas Oil and Gas Association. You know, sorry, Pat. Um, this winter, um, in 2011, uh, the, the commissioner, he launched a... Uh, a website called protectyourtexasborder.com, which chronicles uh, events uh, from farmers and ranchers. And he's got a little uh, great news aggregate site where it says everything that's going on on the border. Uh, you know, whether you agree with it or not, it's there for you all to look at. And uh, that was also a top of the controversy, and it probably still is some folks down there in the valley, sir. Um, Congressman Robert Francis Beto, of course, uh, O'Rourke, because he's from El Paso, is the way he likes to go home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he currently sits on the uh, the Veterans the Veterans Affairs and Homeland Security Committee. Robert Francis. It's so much more relaxed now, you know, compared to last year. Uh, before that, uh, Mr. Orts uh, served on the El Paso City Council. Um, and in 2011, you also were pretty controversial because you co-authored a book with uh, then Councilwoman Susie Bird called uh, "Dealing Death and Drugs." which uh, wasn't for a repeal of marijuana prohibition, what the congressman said is he wanted to have a new dialogue on what scaling back or changing marijuana laws would do for the violence on the border, specifically to that Juarez, that in 2011 was in the throes of a horrendous drug war between the Sinaloa and Juarez cartels that were also at the same time battling each other, guiding the law enforcement. Obviously, that's, whether that was going to spill over or not into the, until El Paso in Texas was a big uh, point of controversy. Thankfully, Ciudad Juarez is a little bit more calm now, but it's always something to look at. 
Um, and last but not least, I have uh, Colonel Steve McCraw, who uh, before was the head of the Texas Department of Public Safety. He served for more than two decades uh, in the FBI. And uh, he was also Governor uh, Rick Perry's Chief of Homeland Security, where he oversaw efforts to increase war security and curb violence related to the drug trafficking cartels. Earlier this summer, uh, your organization began a $1.3 million per week operation uh, that continues something that you, uh, your leadership has started, then, Governor, um, where there's uh, a surge of EPS troops on, on the border. And I don't know how many of you guys have been down there lately, but we were just saying that you know you can't drive from Rio Grande City to, to McAllen without seeing at least a 50 or, or 15 or 20, um, call them Smokies, call them Mapitas, call them Troopers, whatever you want to do, but there's a lot of black and whites out there. And, um, contrary to what the National Guard represents down there for a lot of folks, uh, the, most of the people are on board of the DPS, but the National Guard is a different story. The National Guard recently joined in those efforts, and we'll get to that as well. So if you guys don't mind, a round of applause for our panel. <laughs> Colonel, I, I, want to, uh, I want to start with you. Um, obviously, the, the border surge has been in the news a lot. You recently... Uh, your office recently released some statistics on how that's going. If you could give a, a brief recap, because I think that's something um, that people would like to know about, especially Lieutenant Governor, your party is the party of fiscal responsibility, so I think people want to know what $1.3 million a week of taxpayer dollars are getting down there as it relates to what's going on, specifically in the Rio Grande Valley with EPS. Yes, sir. Uh, week 11, we're in week 11 right now. The, uh, when we started, it was week one when the, the speaker and Lieutenant Governor, Governor uh, directed us to conduct this operation. Really, we're talking about a surge operation. You know, for those in law enforcement, really, it's, it's hot spot police, just, you know, saturation patrols, okay, in high crime areas. And the crime that we're looking at right now, obviously, is smuggling, organized smuggling. And uh, the first week, there was in the area of operation, that's the zones 1 through 13, there were 6,606 uh, undocumented aliens that were uh, detained, apprehended, detained, detained. And of course, there was concern about the continued within that population, that there was 17 percent of the undocumented children. But the other uh, concern was the organized crime as it relates to the cartels, cartel operatives, transnational gangs, and land. That number from 6,606 has dropped to uh, 1,997 in week 11. Uh, it increased 20 since last week. So. We've seen this precipitous drop, and the important part of this is is not you know the numbers. Uh, what uh, you know, although the numbers matter, it's that the numbers drop at a time when we saturated the area, when we increased our apprehension capability. And the point is deterrence. You know, if we don't have, if we can, if we can drive down one of the directives we're given by the, uh, the state leadership and legislature is to is do something about the, the felony pursuits, the home invasions that are being experienced in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, Valley. Uh, also, the stash houses. When I talk about stash houses, human and drug stashes. And when I talk about human stash houses, we've given a, a part of the business model for the cartel is once you get over here, you may have paid your money to get here, but oh by the way, you're not going anywhere. What, what is the what is the National Guard's role specifically? Because I think there's been there's been some question about if they have policing powers, arresting powers, immigration enforcement powers. I've, you know, it's been well documented that they're doing a lot of surveillance. If you could tell us exactly. I, I, I know that there are sensitivities within you know, specific operations, but if you could just let the public know, because that also has a hefty price tag. I think people ought, yeah. people ought to know what they're getting. Well, I mean, very clear. What, they, what they're doing is they're a direct support of civilian authority, and when they were called up, and which means that we, and what we've done is we've looked at, you know, with our local and federal partners, specifically Border Patrol, and to identify, you know, observation posts. where ideally we can situate, okay, you know, uh, Texas military guard personnel and just by being there, they'll be able to observe in what we call uh, interlocking view, field of view so that they can look at and see, you know, smuggling activity and report smuggling activity. They don't have the power to detain or arrest. They have the power to, to detect and report. When they report, they report it. And the Department of Public Safety, that's why you see so many numbers of us down there in great concentration. And Border Patrol as well respond. And uh, I don't want to leave local law enforcement uh, out of the equation. Uh, they will too respond in that sense. Congressman O'Rourke, you, uh, you, you penned an op-ed for our trip talk uh, where you were critical of the deployment. Um, there's, again, West Texas, El Paso is a different situation now, but obviously you want to speak for the entire board. So if you could elaborate on why you think this is just a bad idea. Well, first of all, I, I question the, the cause and effect relationship of deploying guard to the border and using that to account for the drop in children and families fleeing Central America and the United States. I think a lot of people who are looking at this issue agree that in the hot summer months there are fewer people willing to make that journey through Mexico. 
There's also probably a natural peak uh, that may or may not have been reached and that we're on the decline from. But if you look at this more holistically, 15 years ago on the eve of 9-11, you had 1.6 million apprehensions along the southern border. Last year you had 420,000. And this year, even with the peak from Central America, the surge from Central America, we'll, we'll probably not hit half a million. We are at the same time spending more than twice what we were spending 15 years ago, $18 billion a year in federal money on the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, double the size of the Border Patrol. And El Paso, Texas, the city that I'm uh, very lucky to represent in Congress, is the safest city, not just in Texas, but it's the safest city in the entire country. And I say that it is the safest not in spite of having so many immigrants in our community and being right on the border, but precisely because of those factors. But, but on, and let me stop you there because there, you know, you had the, the recent uh, shooting of a, an off-duty border patrol agent, again, not in your district, in the, in the valley. Uh, you had three Honduran nationals uh, who, were, who were violently uh, murdered. You, um, you have uh, an increase in uh, sexual assaults, whether those are being committed by legal, legal uh, immigrants or not. So, but, so it's not to say that, that there is not crime on the border. Is that what you're saying? Or are you just saying that, it's, it's, that people, uh, I guess, what are you saying when you're yeah. saying it's by the border? I'm not saying that there is not crime on the border. I'm saying that the border is much safer on average than the rest of the country, and that it's not just El Paso, it's Laredo, it's San Diego. Other large border cities are, are typically much safer. And again, it's not despite their proximity to Mexico and the presence of immigrants. I think it's precisely because of that. Folks come to this country not to commit crimes by and large, but to get ahead, to provide a better life for themselves and for their children, and to live the American dream. Is there crime sometimes in the border? Yes. Are there folks trying to smuggle drugs and people? Yes. And, and my hat's off to DPS, to the Border Patrol, to CBP, everyone who does everything they can to protect this country and ensure that the border stays safe. But I think our reaction to these kids, and remember these are children coming from Central America, has been disproportionate to the threat. And the scary thing about that is that when we concentrate all of our attention and resources on the border, it's possible that we take our eye off the ball where the real threat resides. And that's in our airports. That's potentially the northern border. That's homegrown extremists and terrorists. And so um, certainly let's be vigilant. Let's continue to guard against threats at the border. But whether we're talking about uh, immigrants or terrorists, which is the talk in Washington today, the southern border has never been safer than it is today. And you can look at any metric uh, to, to judge that, and, it, and it's borne out. Apparently, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, if you, if you exclude organized crime, I agree with you, Coach. But uh, the fact, I don't really think you can exclude organized crime. You have to look at part of the The relationship between them and the war is cartel, the civil cartel. Because, you know, kidnappings matter, extortions matter. And even though they're illegal, you know, they're people. When they come across, the first ones to be victimized in these stash houses is by the cartel and the cartel operatives. And these gangs and the sexual exploitation. And I can't tell you how many cases that we've had to work on human trafficking where we've got, you know, young girls being recruited over by organized crime that are preyed upon, debriefed, threatened, gang raped, and then forced into prostitution. So it may not be counted. It doesn't show up on a stat on a crime uh, sheet, but it does clearly impact the communities. And also, well, I'll, I'll cease for now. <laughs> well, with all due respect, I've been in and out of El Paso so many times, and uh, as we were talking earlier, I've, with uh, your wife Amy. Uh, my grandparents have lived for years and years in El Paso. Great city, but you've had violence in El Paso. To say that our border is safer than the other cities around the country is, uh, is, is, is delusional. What's, what specifically, you just said there's been violence in El Paso, what specifically you Well, you've had incidents well, on, on, on shootings, you've had different, you've had people coming across the border, Here's the bottom line. Um, I asked the DPS. I want to know what the facts are, because the only thing you and, and the governor and others make these allegations about car bombs and violence and shootings. What, what's where are the facts? I, I live there. No one's more concerned about the safety of the community that I represent than I am. I, my three kids are there right now. Well, let me answer your so question. Well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be comfortable being there. Let, well, let, yeah, let me answer your question, and that is that. You were focusing on the humanitarian side and the unaccompanied children just a moment ago. That's only part of this. It's less than, than 20%, some 12 to 18%. When you look at the other 80%, a lot of these people that are coming into the United States have criminal records. People that have come into Texas 
uh, since 2008 uh, uh, who are not legal have committed hundreds of thousands of crimes in Texas and including thousands of murders. And so this is a law enforcement effort, a law enforcement effort to secure the border. The federal government has failed miserably, horribly, to do their constitutional job to secure the border. And so I believe that when the, the federal government fails to do their constitutional job, the states have more than just a right but an obligation to do that job. And so we are trying to protect the people of Texas. That's our number one responsibility for elected officials, to protect the safety of the people who live there. Congressman you showed appropriations. You obviously are well versed in homeland security issues. And, and Congressman Rick, you're on that committee as well. I, I want to talk really quick before we get to, to funding and, and board control levels of staff about the, uh, the this threat, or alleged threat, so-called threat, or very real threat, whoever you ask about, um, ISIS or Islamic extremists using the southern border. Um, it's getting some troubles, obviously, here, because I think you guys will laugh it off. They're supposed to take this very seriously. So what do, what do, uh, what do people at the state level, what does a uh, West Texas sheriff know that two, the two members that are on the, the Homeland Security Committee or subcommittees don't know? I'll be happy to answer that really quickly, if you don't mind, Henry. So the day before yesterday, we had a hearing in Homeland Security with the director of the FBI the director of the National Counterterrorism Center, and the Secretary of Homeland Security. And each of them was asked point blank, is there any threat that you know of from ISIS along our southern border with Texas um, that we should know about? And each of them said there is no credible intelligence or information to lead us to believe that there is any threat whatsoever from ISIS or Hezbollah or Iran or Al-Qaeda or any known terrorist organization. Furthermore, there has never been a connection to a plot, successful or otherwise, uh, reported by terrorists here in, in the United States connected to the southern border. Should we remain vigilant against that? Certainly. Should we continue to guard against it? Is it a possibility? Absolutely. But let's look at the facts and only traffic and deal in the facts. These claims that the border is violent, uh, these, these claims that uh, people are, are coming here to get us, it's bad for the border, it's bad in terms of wasting resources, and it takes our eye off the ball where the real threats are. And last, let me say this, very hard to attract capital, investment and talent to communities like El Paso and Laredo when the public headline is Governor Perry says car bombs are going off in the city of El Paso, ISIS on the border. Those things just are not true. And and, and the, the car bomb thing, and the, the governor, I think he, he realized he made a mistake, and that was three years ago, and it's still being brought up in the news. I guess that, that either, uh, you know, I don't think people say you could be beating the dead horse for that. So, I mean, I think, um, or that, it, it's very real that's going on, but uh, Commissioner, I want to, you know, you, you get the perspective that's a little bit uh, north of the border. Sure. Um, and uh, you, you do with farmers and ranchers, and then Congressman, if, if you wanted to, to follow up with what the Congressman said as far as, because yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, I just want to follow up with you, Congressman, because the Middle Eastern, the Middle Eastern extremists, that's not a new issue that just came out. Uh, you remember former Sheriff Rick Flores and former Sheriff in Zapata County, C.G. Uh, uh, Gonzalez, that said um, they found Al-Qaeda passes or something like that. I mean, did you take it seriously then? Do you take it seriously now? Well, anytime there's a plan, we, we, of course, have to follow up on that. But again, just like Beto said, I mean, we, we ask our intelligence, and I did ask specifically when this came out, and they're saying that there's no credible fear. You know, how somebody else might know that information that our top intelligence officers don't know, I don't know. But again, I'm always one of those, you have to be ready just in case, and we have to be vigilant about this, because if you look at it, the bad guys have to get it right one time. That's all they have to do, just get it right one time. We have to get it right every single time as we, uh, as we do that on the, uh, the border. But uh, let me just, uh, just talk about the border and border security. This is why I break up border security. First, what's the border? The border is a region that has millions of people on both sides. Uh, it's hubs of activity where every day there's $1.3 billion of trade between the U.S. and Mexico, half a trillion dollars last year. Uh, you know, the movement of trucks, you know, Laredo, largest uh, port around, I think, it's after L.A., New York, Laredo's third in the country. We get 12,000 trailers a day. It's been it's, 100, uh, since, from Jan January to July, I think, $150 billion of two-way trade in the Laredo Customs District. And yeah, El Paso it, second. It, yeah, it, it's huge. So, first of all, you got to look at what the border is. It's, it's a highly... Uh, it's, a, it's a place where there's a lot of activity. It creates a lot of activity for both sides. You know, on, on my side, just going into your ne next profession is, I, I have a lot of the Eagle Forge. Sure. So you see the energy. On the other side, you're going to have the Borges 
uh, also the you know the, the basin over there where they're going to probably have the same thing that we have so you're going to have a lot more activity what's the border that's the way i see the border well, we addressed uh, uh, lieutenant governor Deere's comments and that it's not i mean that there that there is criminal activity going well but let me first say what's the border to us because sure. we see the border very differently as, as, as an area second of all is security how do we address a threat well, first of all, you know, anytime there's a threat, you gotta identify the threat, and there's different, there's organized crime, there could be terrorist uh, crime, there could be other type of threats. So you first you, you identify the threat, then you decide what's the appropriate measure to address that. Now, if you think that if you put a, a wall, uh, a border patrol, a national guard, and that solves the whole issue, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't, you've got to look at how best to address that issue. And, it, and a lot of time people have a tendency of just focusing between the ports of entry. Ports of entries are very, very, very important to us. So, it, it, and, and the other thing is, just generally speaking, on addressing those threats, either we can keep playing defense on the one yard line, which is called the US Mexico border, where we spend over $18 billion, or do we look at playing defense on the 20 yard line working with mexico and central american countries and to follow up on the comments i, I think what we really have is a tale of two borders we have a very robust dynamic economy mexico is the state of texas number one trading partner over 500,000 jobs created in the lone star state 200 billion dollars of trade last year just between our state and that nation and then we have a very dangerous situation that it it, it, it is it is not conducive to solving the drug problems and the crime and the unlawful entry if we say that it's better than ever because the stats show that from 2011 to 2013, apprehensions in Texas has increased by 100%. I mean, those are the which, stats. Which, which stats? Border Patrol the, stats? Because Customs and Border Patrol stats, about 119,000 were apprehended in Texas in 2011. That number rose to 235,000 in 2013. Yeah, but those are just, just the apprehensions. That, They're not all right. the people to get across. And, and, and we even have great data, Governor, to, to Operation Drawbridge, the cameras has detected 95,000 people since they've been put up, but they've only apprehended 46,000, so it's less than half are being apprehended. It's very real. Our policy needs to be this. We need to separate the drug runners from the job seekers. And I think that is the approach that will help and, law enforcement. And immigration reform, we do that. And we have a temporary guest worker plan. The people that want to come and do their job will come in into the U.S., and the bad guys will be the ones who focus our and there's, on. And I agree with you. There's so much distrust right now because it hasn't been addressed. We do need to secure our border. Part of an effective conservative border security policy is to have a guest worker program where people are coming in legally, not illegally. If, if I could say, we can go back to you, Lieutenant Governor. Your, your letter was, it was, it was, it was harsh. It was a harsh letter. It was a harsh rebuke of what the Mexican government said. And I, I want to compare that to a, the letter that uh, the Governor Perry sent. I mean, Governor Perry called Mexico, um, you know, said neighbors and were friends. Uh, you, and, uh, to, the comment, to, to, the, to the comment that you said, though, do, do you think that Mexico is, is, um, failing to secure it or to, to prevent the flow on purpose? Do you think they're, they're not capable of doing it? What I was addressing was the fact that on, uh, on the date in which I think most Americans are very sensitive about 9-11, sure. the Mexican government through President Pena put out a letter that said that our actions on the border to include the Texas National Guard were a political stunt where we were politicizing. It was all about politics. And there is, that's, it couldn't be further from the truth. I started seven years ago when I realized the federal government was incapable or unwilling to do their job to secure the border, uh, appropriating the money for the border. And over the last seven years, I've appropriated $800 million for high altitude spotter aircraft, helicopters, armor plated gunboats, more people, sheriff's departments. And that's given the, the strength to an excellent, we're very lucky to have Colonel. McCraw is our director. That's given him the ability to run a surge and at least on the Rio Grande Valley and, and to drop people crossing the border. Uh, we're not militarizing. Mexico militarized for years its border with Guatemala by putting the Mexican army. Uh, as the colonel just got through explaining, we're, this is a force multiplier. National Guard, just to see and report. Congressman, you're, you're shaking your head, and, and real quick, I wanted to ask anyhow. Um, in, in Chihuahua a few years back, and in Tamaulipas currently, um, Mexico does have an army presence. Um, what, what, is the, what is the difference uh, between when they send the military to their border and when we send uh, I've been the stopped by Mexican military in interior Mexico 
They're using their military every day. I have too. It's, I mean, it's, it's we're, part we're the United States. Here. We have a wonderful 225 year history of not deploying the army within this country. Yeah, yeah. And when we deploy the army within this country and ask them to do police work instead of military work, we get really bad results. We know the story of Ezekiel Hernandez, who was shot uh, by a Marine when we deployed the Marines to the border uh, in the Clinton administration. The Border Patrol, I think we'll all agree, do a great job. The men and women who serve in that capacity have perhaps the toughest role in federal government. Tough conditions, uncertain circumstances. They may meet drug runners, they may meet immigrants who are coming here uh, to, to find a better life. And they do a great job. We don't need the National Guard. But, I mean, but we know that both Presidents Obama and Bush have deployed the National Guard. And in Congressman, if you would help Texans to get parity with the number of Border Patrol agents per border mile, as New Mexico, Arizona, and California does. I'd be right there with you. Let's send the National Guard back home, but let's get the same strength level as our other states have. You know, I, I agree with you. That, uh, our, our friend, Chairman Mike McCall, Chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, wrote a bill called the Border Security Results Act, of which I'm a, a co-sponsor. That would make sure that we use existing assets and deploy them based on risk where they're needed without necessarily having to spend billions of dollars more to protect the border. I think we all would like to consider ourselves fiscal conservatives. If we're spending $18 billion a year, almost three times actually what we were spending 15 years ago, you would think that we would want to deploy those assets and spend that money as wisely as possible. We don't want to throw money at the problem. We want to deploy current assets where they're needed, where the risk is. And, and so I agree with you on that point. Uh, Just let's Claire, spread them out better. When, when, I was, uh, when I was in Laredo, um, there was a National Guard there, and, uh, and nobody really seemed to, uh, to be quite upset about that because it was, uh, it was a new an initiative at the national level from the Democratic president. Is, there, is it purely politics here, or I mean, what is the well, difference between you know, a national well, government? Well, my, my position is just a little different. My position is that once they make that decision to bring the National Guard down there, I'm going to support those men and women to do their job. <laughs> Understanding that the men and women down there in the National Guard cannot enforce uh, uh, the um, immigration law. They can't do it. So all they do is they're there to support. Now, did I personally think that the National Guard was needed at this particular time? My answer was no. But once that decision was made, uh, then let's go ahead. Because even Border Patrol said it was not a law enforcement issue. Because if you saw the kids, they were turning themselves in. In Mission, Texas, there was one time where 281 uh, kids and families just went in and said, Aquí estamos. here we are. So, I mean, I would have used the resources, but once. Well, it, but, it focus on the kids, it focused on the law enforcement side. Yeah. The 80%. Right. But, but again, I, again, the focus is, you know, once DPS uh, went down there, I'm going to support them. Once the National Guard went down there, I'm going to support them. Uh, the National Guard, I think that could have waited a while, but still, nevertheless, I'll support them once they go down there. But you're right. Uh, they've been there for years. And I've always told people they've been here for a lot of years under these and ours. Uh, but understanding that they're not going to be there at the border and forcing immigration uh, reform. Colonel, if I can go back to you, when the, when the border surge was, was announced recently, DPS was very specific to send out, I think it was a, a separate statement, saying that they're not going to do roadblocks because that raised concern about immigration, uh, immigration checks and they're not going to do any immigration enforcement. What exactly is the state police, the police's role when it comes across somebody that is an undocumented immigrant, they think is an undocumented immigrant, and how can you, I guess, um, try to calm some nerves that this might be, quote unquote, racial profiling when, when there's a surge of law enforcement down there? Yeah. Well, if it saw the makeup of our patrol force down there, they wouldn't call it racial profiling to begin with, but, but recognize that, you know, first and foremost, their job is to support state law, period. If they have reasonable suspicion that a federal crime is being uh, engaged, or let's say a bailout situation, they report it to Border Patrol. The Border Patrol addresses it. There's no state immigration statute. We don't work immigration. We don't have 287G. We don't want 287G. We don't want to do enforcement. 287G is, is where uh, there's a certain uh, the training component where state-based um, enforcement can, or law enforcement can do immigration. Exactly. Deputize you know, state troopers or deputies or to, to do the paperwork as it relates to ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement for removal. We don't want that. We've got enough to do. We want to stay on the highways and roadways, number one. Number two is that, uh, you know, the one that called for the regulatory checkpoints is is none, none other than myself. So I, I, I'm the one that made that uh, call on that. Is, uh, and that the, the point was that, hey, this is a very cost-effective and efficient way to do uh, compliance issues as relates to the driver's license compliance and also insurance uh, compliance. And bottom line is, though, it detracted from our security operations because it sounded and appeared that we were 
you know, operating these all the time, even though they're we're consistent with the Supreme Court rulings on this. So, you know, I made a, I made a commitment to Senator Hinoza, who called, and if the senator says he didn't like it, he thinks it was detracting, then I shut it down. And what? we will not be doing those unless the state legislature says, we want the Department of Public Safety to do, to do uh, these regulatory checkpoints under these certain guidelines. What's what's the what do the next few months have if the numbers keep dropping um, and the statistics? I mean, it seemed uh, this was a hot news item. I, I you know a lot of journalists I saw were in the valley for, for six weeks. You know, some of them didn't, didn't leave. It, it seemed to have subsided. Congressman, you, you know, you made you made the mention that it could be um, because of weather, because of other other factors. So how long is DPS going to be down then? Well, we're just we just implement policy. However long the legislature tells it to be down. <laughs> yes, because you wanted a continuous search, correct? Guys, we're, we're overlooking the, the basic problem. Um, your, your surge is basically focused on one sector, the Rio Grande Valley sector. Am I not correct? All right. That's, a, what, 120 miles? Yes, sir. 120 miles out of a 1,200-mile border. We're focusing on 10% of the border. It has 56% of the problem right now. Sure. True. The nation, true. not just for Texas. The nation. But, but until and unless... Until and unless we're able to address the, the, the whole border, all but 1,200 miles, I don't think most Texans, most Texans, are going to be satisfied that that the state or the federal government has done enough to stop illegal immigration. The whole subject of guest visa—I mean, that's—I mean, that's where I think the country has to go at some point. Uh, but uh, again. Not a pathway to citizenship, but at least uh, the people that that want to be here and work that they can have a visa. But we're never going to get there, both politically and morally, until we secure the border. What what, what are you, Lieutenant Governor, willing to do to do that? I and mean, we could literally place uh, a border patrol agent, you know, one foot apart from the next border patrol agent, or have tanks lined up, or wall the entire border, or as uh, Stephen Colbert has said. Uh, put a moat with alligators and <laughs> what, what are we willing to do to achieve that? I mean, how much do you want to spend? How many people do you want to put out? It, it's an unrealistic goal to get to 100% deterrence or 100% security. You're never going to get to 100%. Right now in the Rio Grande Valley, on apprehensions, which doesn't mean the total number of people crossing the border illegally. What, Steve, you've got a 65% drop from when you started on June 23rd, approximately. But, but that's not victory until you shut the border down. Now, that's the reason, Congressman, that, that I, and I didn't do it alone, but, um, but, but working with the Senate and the House, we appropriated almost $800 million to give uh, both high-altitude spotter aircraft helicopters so that we can have a force multiplier so that we don't have to have everyone within a foot of each other, uh, so that we can be efficient, and we can give the people of Texas the confidence. I've got a lot of friends, you've got a lot of friends that live between the border and checkpoints, and their homes are armed. we got a lot, I'm sure, in common friends, uh, we've got some common friends, who they've sent their, their wives and their families back to the cities because it's dangerous to live out there in the ranch. We need to secure the border. Con Congressman, uh, the, the boots on the ground, the appropriations, Congressman O'Rourke, I mean, I I'm sure you've heard people in El Paso would say, I, I see a Border Patrol, and, and, they're, and they're sitting in the car, and they're, they're staring at the computer screen. Beyond that, they're staring at the fence. They don't, they're not doing anything. But in the Valley, I've also heard people say, we need more. So what's, what, how many more Border Patrol agents are coming to Texas if you, can, if you can give us an amount? And what's the appropriation on that? Because it seems to be like a lot of blame is being spent, sent up to D.C. to where y'all are saying, hey, you know, Arizona, California, New Mexico has this many per mile that Texas is... is yeah, I, I personally have had a disagreement with both the both administrations on this issue is because if, if you look at what numbers of Border Patrol should have as per apprehensions, there are some areas that have very, very, very low apprehensions, uh, but a lot of Border Patrol, and I think some of those should be shifted around. Uh, when we added a thousand new Border Patrol back in, two, in 2010, Half of them went to Arizona. And I told the commissioner, why are you sending half of them over there? And he said, well, they're going to be there on a mobile strike force. And I said, well, look, mobile strike force? Oh, yeah, they can be moved around any time. I said, look, once they, open, once they buy homes and they settle their families, they're not going to be very mobile. And sure enough, when all this thing happened down here, I asked them about the mobile strike force, and he just looked at me with a blank stare. So I've had disagreements with how they should move that. Uh, it should move people around per apprehension and other levels on that. But the other thing, let me just say this. 
All we're talking about is playing defense on the one-yard line. We still got to work with Mexico and the other countries uh, because if not, I'd rather play defense on their 20-yard line instead of coming over here. One of the things we've been asking uh, uh, Mexico is to stop, uh, to stop, uh, you know, start really focusing on the Guatemala border, have their they, southern border have, have over they, there. Have they done that? Yeah, uh, they're starting to do that. I've been there, and when I was there in one of the bridges, you literally had people in rafts and, 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 and tubes just going up there, no control at all. And if it's open down there, then all we're going to do is play defense on the one-yard line called the U.S. Mexico border. Commissioner, you want to say something? I agree with working in those countries. I think the reason that the apprehensions are low is directly attributable to the buildup in that area. It sends a signal, the strong message, we will not tolerate unlawful entry. The reason why it's so bad today as compared to a decade ago is the warring drug cartels. And so we need a unified front, first of all. And I think the way that we measure the metrics, the big question of what is a secure border, is to put the resources that are necessary for border security as a part of that modernize our, our guest worker program and create a Southwest Border Security Commission because there's no one time we've arrived element made up of bipartisan members of the House and Senate that are appointed and to make them have a report to Congress and the President before you guys vote on Homeland Security's appropriations every year. Make certain that it's from people from the border that here on the ground that we work with every day that are telling us these stories. And then I think we can get to that point to where we need to be. And, and what I said on, on Luna Vision the other night was that, that if we can get Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, to work together, and we can start working with um, our friend, our partner, the country of Mexico, we can solve this. My heart goes out to Mexico and everything they've done. I mean, they've lost 40,000 people have been killed because of the narco you know, and the drugs in, in, in northern Mexico. So, so they've been fighting this war, but we need to come together and, and, um, and start, just like you said, playing uh, maybe not on the 20, but on the 50 or <laughs> You shut things down in Guatemala. Stop them from coming here. Congressman Roy, you mentioned uh, HR 1417. I think it was at the, uh, the bill, um, and that was legislation that was offered by uh, a conservative Republican, the chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee. It got bipartisan support from the committee. A lot of Democrats supported it. Why is it just what, what's what's next for Washington? Is this going to be continued gridlock in your eyes? You think? You know that that bill, despite passing out of committee unanimously with full bipartisan support, has stalled because. In everyone's mind, as you said at the outset, border security is tied to immigration. And because immigration is not moving forward, this component of what the country sees as immigration is not moving forward. Let me, let me say one quick thing on, on your last question. In El Paso last year, uh, the average agent made four apprehensions during the entire year. And to the point that uh, the commissioner is making and the congressman is making, we can, we can better deploy current assets, which the McCall bill, I think, would give us some force to do. And, and to the fear that, that you speak of, Lieutenant Governor, I, I see it in Washington, D.C. Hey, Bethel, do you have to wear a bulletproof vest when you walk around the streets of El Paso? Um, or, you know, do you have a security detail? When we say things that aren't true about murderous uh, immigrants, about bullets flying and bombs going off and the border being unsafe, I can't tell you how much it hurts this state, the community I represent, the people that I care for. It makes it very difficult for us to get ahead. And when El Paso gets ahead, when Laredo gets ahead, when RGV gets ahead, the state gets ahead. Because as you said, Texas is, uh, Mexico is Texas's number one trading partner. Jobs are connected to that, opportunities connected to that. And when we operate out of fear and create additional anxiety, it makes it very hard for us to capitalize on that. So we must only traffic and work in the truth with facts. And I, and I think, I, I think you're misrepresenting on what uh, is being said. Um, I think El Paso is a safe city. I've been there many times. I think El Paso, I'll say it again, El Paso is a, a safe city from what I see. But the whole border is not safe. It is a fact that hundreds of thousands of crimes have been, have been committed by people that have come into Texas uh, fr from our southern border over the years, including a lot of murders. Those are facts. Colonel, if you could, can, you, can you back up that? Because I, I saw the, uh, the, the statistics that came out, and from what I understand, those were, uh, those were charges. And I asked, uh, I asked Mr. Vineyard in the communications department whether those were charges or convictions. And those have been charged just at that time. So, so how many of those charges actually were, were convictions? Do we have a number on, on that? I'll, I don't have the exact number on those convictions, but the, 
Those were simply what it was. Okay. Charge charges. Okay. Charge yeah. charges. And, and, we know crimes are occurring in that, that 70 plus percent approximately of the border it's is out there are in unincorporated yeah, areas. Yeah, but everybody just blames the immigrants. Every time there's a problem, it's always the, it's the immigrants and so. I mean, you know, we've had people across the borders, and I'll use the line that I think I used last time here. We've had people moving uh, across borders. You know, we've got to have some sort of sensible, uh, comprehensive immigration reform uh, on that. Uh, you know, there's a story about this person that was in charge of the border, and he saw five families that came in, and, and they started taking over some of the lands, and, and, and this person said, you know, we got to do something about those families. we got to kick them out. So he wrote a letter to the central authorities. The only thing is that was written in 1830 in Espanol by a Mexican officer when uh, five fa families across the Red River to Texas, taking over the part uh, that used to be uh, Mexico itself. So we've had these issues about people crossing over, but we just can't demonize uh, the folks. You know, in Laredo, uh, in Laredo, in Laredo, the murder rate uh, a couple years ago was three murders per 100,000. In Washington, D.C., where we work, it's 15 murders per 100,000. So. I, I mean, uh, any time you start attacking a community, it's hard to get doctors. One of the reasons we couldn't get some of the uh, doctors uh, at the VA clinic in Laredo because they were afraid to come down here. One of the reasons we can't, and this is a true story, we couldn't even get uh, some of the military folks from San Antonio to stay at La Posada because they said, quote, it was too dangerous. And I called and said, what the heck are y'all doing <laughs> saying that the border is too dangerous, La Posada? This, I said, first of all, you're military. Second of all, you're on the U.S. side, and how can you say La Posada is too dangerous? So, look, you know, do we have to watch out for threats? Heck yes. You know, we always have to watch out for threats. But we just can't demonize things to a point. Folks, real quick, if you guys want to start lining up for questions, I think we're about to segue into that. All right, but let me just quickly, you know, very quickly, so I'm answering. Henry, you know me very well. All right. We're, I'm not talking... We're talking about securing the border from a law enforcement point of view. You know that, that there may be some people that, that try and demonize people that are crossing <coughs> the border, but Commissioner Staples and David Dewhurst are not, not people no, no, that do that. We're not talking no, about no, that. No, no, That's not how we can solve it. Listen, 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 you guys are friends of mine. All I gotta say is, you know, yes, we gotta secure the border. Yes, we gotta, you know, always be, but, but it's, how, what tone and how we use it because it's always a border. Oh, I agree it, with even it's like 9-11, none of those terrorists came in through the southern border. Uh, you know, every time there's a threat, it's always the southern border, the southern border, the southern border. I'm just Not as concerned about the northern border as I am the southern border. I'm going to take By the way, 40% of the people that we have here out of the 11, 12 million came in through legal, legal visas, visas yeah. permits, and got here illegally. Yeah, we got to fix Ma'am, your question. Thank you. Hey, um, good morning. Hi. Um, good morning, Lieutenant Governor, mm -hmm. Congressman, uh, Commissioner, and Colonel. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Pancotti. I'm a student from Dallas. Um, and over the last few years, we've seen the border conversation shift between immigration reform, border uh, patrol and security, and we're even seeing the emergency or the emergence of terrorism on the border. Um, so, in your opinions, why have these shifts occurred, and do you believe that it's possible to solve all three of these problems if they're um, a problem with one clear, comprehensive solution, or is it necessary for us to make these separate discussions and issues, um, thus leading to disjointed solutions? So separate individual policy? I mean, it doesn't yeah. seem like anybody's getting anywhere with anything comprehensive. So. I think there's two reasons for it. One is the warring drug cartels have heightened the level of uh, physical and uh, attacks on one another, and we've suffered from that. And then secondly, in our country today, it's easier for an employer to hire someone here that's undocumented than it is to hire a legally documented worker. And that's a real tragedy because our system has failed and it's broken. And that's where it leads us today. That's why we need to acknowledge Mexico as a dynamic trading partner, but we also need to acknowledge that we have a porous border. Otherwise, children couldn't walk across and turn themselves in if our border was secure. That is only a camouflage for the drug cartels to do whatever they want. Uh, on that note, Commissioner, I'm going to interject sure. here. Um, there was, a, there was a, a few bills that would crack down on um, hiring undocumented folks, at least in the construction industry. I didn't get anywhere in the GOP controlled Texas House and GOP controlled Texas Senate with the Republican governor. Who's the blame for that? 
Well, I think both parties have let us down when it comes to securing our border and reforming our immigration system. There's no doubt in that. And that's why we're here today to, to talk about those solutions that can address them. Yeah. Hi, my name is Laura. Uh, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, border security is not only stopping immigrants. <laughs> it's the U.S. citizens being recruited by the criminals across the border. Um, the drug lords don't always cross over and some of them even live in the United States legally. Uh, they bribe citizens and sometimes police officials, so it'd be better to maybe have more FBI involved, more intelligence, instead of having more boots. Well, how's it occurring? I guess maybe that's for you, the intelligence on this side, because, uh, I mean, to her point, Congressman, I mean, just how do you I mean, he's a U.S. citizen that was recruited by the set as in 06 to commit murders in Laredo, Texas. So how well is intelligence to ferret out people who operate? They were very well articulated. Uh, well, clearly the cartel's operating model is corrupt, but not just in Mexico, but on the side of the border. And we're mindful of that concern about it. And we've had, you know, some recent tragedies and that undermines the democratic rule when law enforcement officers betray the trust of the people and go on the dark side. And it clearly is a problem. Uh, secondly, uh, pointed out, yeah, we do have command and control elements of seven of the eight Mexican cartels operating in Texas. And the link up with gangs is most disturbing. That's what I think you're referring to. So when we're talking about transnational gangs, we can say MS-13. We're talking about state-based gangs in Texas, syndicate, Mexican mafia, uh, Tango Blast. We've had a recent case where, just to show you about how you can get over what the really driving factor of this is this border is about drugs, is a, is a, a Chinese gang working with a Bloods sect, working with a Mexican, working with the Mexican Mafia, working with the Tango Blast, and working with the Gulf Cartel. You know, and oh, by the way, Aryan Brotherhood. Okay, so you can only take race so long when it's money. So our question is, how do you how do you how do you slow that? How do you stop? It? You have to use a whole well, you know, as policymakers, from a, from a, a practitioner, you know, former FBI, work the corruption piece, work the transnational gang, Juan Garcia, Africa, all those models. It takes it takes boots and it takes wingtips. Okay, you have to do it all, and, uh, and you have to you have to target command and control. You have to degrade your capacity in the area of operation. And we're talking about capacity, that even, that's even stash houses, that's corruption, and that's command and control. You have to look at the command and control in our major metropolitan areas as well. But at the end of the day, you know, a, a, when, you, when the cartels can move people, people forget that you get 2,000, if you just look at the number of people that have been apprehended in Texas this year, calendar year, 251,000, if the cartels get 2,000, a low number, let's lowball that number of $2,000 a piece. That is a low number. That's a half a billion dollars we're talking about. And that's just the ones that were apprehended. So it's big money. And, and the, uh, the idea that, that they're involved in all of these criminal activities, and the only way you're going to be able to slow, to slow that down, frankly, best, you know, we, we help. But the enemy, of the, the enemy of the government of Mexico is the Mexican cartels, and that's our enemy. And to the extent that we can hurt them, that they're ready. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me just, uh, just add, add one thing. Uh, we have to recognize that the uh, drug cartels are <coughs> transnational. You know, they don't just stay in their area. They're, they're already in, uh, the Mexican drug cartels are in over 250 American cities, including here in Austin here. Now, they don't do the same thing uh, that they do over there, you know, the type of violence, because our civil inst institutions are a lot stronger. Our prisons, our prosecutors, our jails, I mean, everything, the judges, they're a lot stronger. And that's what, you know, in those countries, when you have civil institutions are weak, then the uh, drug organizations can come in and permeate it and take over that. Uh, so we got to recognize it's a transnational uh, organization that we have to fight it with intelligence and cooperation with other countries. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm a little confused. Um, the congressman stated they were told that ISIS is not a threat to Texas. But last night in the debate, um, the attorney general said that he had prosecuted successfully an ISIS terrorist. Um, who's telling the truth? Attorney General is not here, but I don't know if anyone wants to, to speak to that. Uh, you know, I, I can just reiterate that we heard from the very highest levels of federal law enforcement this week, categorically, there is no known threat or credible intelligence linking an ISIS plot or an Al-Qaeda, or for that matter, any terrorist organization on our southern border. This is not new. Uh, someone sent me a headline from the El Paso Herald Post from 1981, Libyan hit squad suspected on the border. Whenever we're scared of something in this country, we project that fear to the border. The Soviets 
are coming in through New Mexico. Libyan terrorists are coming into Mexico. Al Qaeda after 9 11. But what we do is Hezbollah, ISIS. And it's just not true. And, and those of us who live there and know the facts have a responsibility to share those well, facts. True. With the public. What is true, factually, is that three Ukrainians were apprehended in Brewster County, Texas this summer. What is true is that an Urdu dictionary was uh, found after people were fleeing and Border Patrol were chasing them. I mean, these are all real facts that people are coming into the United States. And this is this is documented. This is documented by law enforcement. It's, it's very real. Well, and what is true is you're finding prayer rugs along uh, the brush near the uh, the border. What is true that the head of of, of ISIS said, and 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 I'm concerned about the northern border. I'm concerned about the southern border. Uh, I'll see you in New York. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and the other thing is, please understand what Beto and I are saying is we're saying that there's no credible fear right now. I mean, but that doesn't mean that we could not. But keep in mind that through the use of so social media, the way that drug organizations and drug cartels use, uh, you know, the way they recruited some of the kids uh, to, to come in, the, the bad guys are doing that right now. And through social media, how do you think that they've been able to recruit about a hundred Americans, foreign fires, uh, for, uh, foreign fires to go over there? Uh, in Europe, over two thousand uh, uh, foreign fighters have gone over to Syria. So I mean, it's it. I mean, yeah, the threat could, can come in from outside, but it could be somebody here who's disillusioned and wants to belong to something, and they might think ISIS might be the group that they they, they might belong to. Sir, my name is Humberto Vela. I ranch in Zapata County. And I have a two-part question. One is, what are the pursuit protocols for the DPS agents that are down in the valley? And also, what are the mechanisms for repairs to private property and damages that might occur during those pursuits? The pursuit policy is simple. Is that if it's a felony, if someone runs, uh, it's a felony, and, uh, and we will uh, attempt to apprehend them. However, if at any time it's a risk, if there's a great risk to the public, uh, that troop is obligated to shut it down. To the point where you know, we'll chase them so far, but uh, and we will not, you know, have a policy where we turn, you know, where we will disregard it. But there's a point where you can uh, endanger the public, and we've got an obligation to look at. And you have to look at the totality of the circumstances in every situation. Is different. In the second part, are there any mechanisms that we're being? Not that I'm aware of. Is that some, is that something that you think should be in? That's, that's not my decision. That's a policy decision. Let's play a well, well, let me just say something on, on that, at least on the federal side. Uh, talking to, I've sat down with a lot of uh, uh, ranchers, uh, and on the federal side, that is an issue also. Uh, so I got the GAO already doing a study right now uh, to find mechanisms and ways that so we can come back and do a, a reimbursement, a reimbursement uh, 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 mechanism on that because I know it's an issue, at least on the federal side. Border Patrol does uh, some job on repairing, uh, but we got to find it, uh, find a way that's a little bit more efficient than what it is right now. But Thank for the you. ranchers, that's Thanks, Congressman. Yeah. We've heard about hundreds of thousands of people coming across the border, and um, we've heard about finding prayer rugs. How do we get to se separate fear mongering from bigotry from fact? How many of these thousands of people are, are in fact have been found guilty of anything? It kind of goes back to the question on charges and actual convictions. I, I, I think the Southwest Border Security Commission is a very real way to do it in a bipartisan way where you have five Republicans <laughs> and Democrats from the South Southern border states to look at this annually before the Congress votes on appropriations and see the numbers and see separate fact from fiction and I think that's a way to bring us together and not from political people but from appointees from both the speaker and the minority leader and the same set up in the Senate and then two from the president would be the way to approach that. Don't delay in putting the resources there but then to have that as that oversight is a, is a, is a, is a good method to address your question, very real question that needs to be addressed. Sen Senator Jeff Flake, if I can just have this. Quickly, quickly please. please. Senator Jeff Flake has said, and, I, and, and both of us agree, that if you have a good, efficient guest worker plan where people can come and do the work, for coming in for economic reasons, then Border Patrol and the other law enforcement can focus on the bad guys that have a different motive. Sure. 
Uh, yes, my name is Bernardo Paredes. I'm a student at the University of Texas, born and raised in Laredo. Uh, my question is... Um, that's, a recent... double, that's a double yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> my question is just on the detention centers. Um, over the summer, there was an uh, increase in women and children crossing, and when they'll be detained, they'll be sent to these detention centers that look like jail cells. There was bar fences based on what CNN and Fox News was covering with the cameras. So my question is, how will the detention centers change just to accommodate for the women and children that are not criminals but are just crossing just to be with family or search for work. There's a, there's a very large detention center uh, not too far, well about three hours from El Paso, Texas in Artesia, New Mexico. And I've been out there you now twice. It's really uh, in effect a deportation facility where families come in, 833 family members so far. I believe all of two have been bonded out. One at $25,000 because this 25-year-old Guatemalan woman with two little children is a national security threat. And, and uh, over 250 uh, have been deported back to their countries of origin. I don't need to tell you that they're fleeing very violent, very dangerous situations. And in many cases, yes, they're also trying to reunite with family here in the United States. I think we owe it to ourselves and to this country to honor the best traditions of the United States and make sure that these people fleeing violence are taken care of, that we afford them due process, and where we can, we take the most humane option possible. And it's, it's not something new. We've done this for many different peoples over many decades and hundreds of years, in fact. And so this is the latest opportunity for, El pa uh, for the country to put its best foot forward. And I hope that we can do that. Good job, Carson. Thank, thank you for the question from Loretta to El Paso. No, I'll try to be really quick. But OK, this is a tough and odd conversation because we're conflating immigration with security and crime. Uh, and I don't know if it's based on presumption of criminality based on ethnicity or geography or whatnot, but when you take, separate the two and you just look at crime, I'm from, I'm from El Paso and I'm from, from Round Rock also, so okay, both places, but you know, growing up in El Paso, the, the news every night is nothing compared to Austin or Dallas or Houston, because the crime out here is, What's the question? It, it, it's really violent. And in fact, we found two terrorists in Round Rock that were homegrown, and they didn't come from Florida. So this is the question, when you just look at crime, in El Paso, we had a 13-year-old girl that was a 12-year-old girl that was taken from school and she was sexually assaulted and left at the theater. Guess who did it? Not an illegal immigrant. It was a civilian employee of, of, of the Army base, of Fort Bliss there in El Paso. There was a heinous crime that was convicted in El Paso where, I'm, I'm, I'm it's two seconds. So oh, a, a man uh, stabbed a woman, I think it was his wife or something, and she was pregnant and she died. That was a, a, a soldier from Fort Bliss. So when you look at actual crime in El Paso, it's not people coming from Mexico. By and large, these heinous crimes are being conducted by military personnel in the community. It's a strange question because that doesn't fall within the framework that, that you've created, but that's the reality of El Paso. You're from El Paso, Colonel, I believe you're from El Paso, so maybe you can end well, I'll, I'll, Congressman. Because, yeah, if you don't mind, so I can get a plug into El Paso. Is it, <laughs> I think the reason that the safest city in the world is a uh, chief police Greg Allen, a great police department in a community that supports law and order and law enforcement. They do a great job. Uh, and, and the crime is different. It's entirely different. They bridge cases in terms of how Barrio Stepper works and how drugs come over compared to the same thing in the right Laredo. Same thing. Bridge cases is a major problem. It's not it's not the no, I think the answer I have, I have one last question. I had the opportunity to go to El not El Paso, you guys keep talking about that, with Allen at the end of July um, and work with the refugees. And I choose to call them refugees. Um, I think they've been pretty poorly portrayed uh, by the media. There are a lot of desperate people trying to flee bad circumstances, but my question really is, because we have such a polarized nation, what are the representatives of the state of Texas doing to let Homeland Security and every other representative and senator from every other state in the union understand that we will never be able to build a wall along the entire edge of Texas that will keep people in or out. Because if you want to know how it felt to me when I was in McAllen, it's like a police state for Americans as much as it is a police state for the Mexicans to stay out of or the, or the Central Americans. Uh, my, my dad grew up in the radio, it wasn't like that. The question is, does, does, do all of you ever make a point in your commentary to people to let them understand that border security can't just be a wall? It, it, there are people that think a wall will take care of it. It won't take care of it. It needs to, it needs to be much more holistic in the answer. 
So, I mean, is that something that you're getting or you're doing anything about talking about? Yeah, I, I, I know Beth and I will always do that. Uh, a wall is a 14th century uh, solution to a 21st century problem. And I'm waiting for a day for a Mexican president to get on the other side of the, of the wall and say, Mr. President, tear down this wall, as Ronald Reagan did some years ago. Uh, and, and again, you know, we got to look at, you know, when I start off, what is security? Identify the, thir uh, the, the threats find the best way to, to address that, uh, and then make sure that we work with our international partners. Folks, we're out of time. Thank you so much for uh, <laughs>